to be able to use market information. So this is the latest trend uh, in base breeding using genomic selection models so if you ask me what are the major technological breakthroughs which have come in, in the last uh, decade or so in base breeding, I would say these are ones. Double rapids, as I told you earlier, high density genotyping platforms. This, this is making uh, every day the prices are falling. It's like our cell phone technology. Ten years back it used to be very expensive, but now you know with two thousand uh, for two thousand rupees you can get a decent Similarly, the data points, cost per data point is falling down in platforms. And there is another important tool called the CDA to base genotype. Generally, you extract DNA from where? From leaf samples, right? But this is a method which extracts DNA from seed. And this is a kind of non destructive method. So you can take a small portion of the endosperm, study the DNA, and make an inference whether that seed carries the thalamolarly or not. If it carries, you take it to the field and plant it, and you can get a plant out of it right from that seed. That's a non destructive method. Another important tool, as I told you, is GWAS, genome wide association studies. Genomic selection is another important tool. Bioinformatics and high efficiency computing is coming up. And as I told you, precision and high phenotyping is also gaining lot of momentum. We are not discussing about these things, we will mostly discuss about GWAS and GS. These are two major approaches which I feel uh, as a student of plant breeding and genetics that uh, you should know about these things. So just a few words on double haploid technology. So this is how you derive conventionally inbreds, right? You make crosses, P1 and P2. F1 and then this is passed through a number of generations to get to experimental hybrid state. So from F1 to experimental hybrid, you have to uh, pass through at least six to seven generations, right, to get a reasonably homozygous number. So, whereas in case of double haploids, you make a cross P1 by P2, you have an F1, and then you can induce directly in F1 <coughs> haploids. Okay, once haploids are induced, they can be subject to chromosome doubling. So, haploids become double haploids, and double haploids can directly be used for an generating test process. So you are considerably shortening the time frame. Okay. And this also helps you in generating large number of lines. You can generate any number of DH lines from human cross. Right. And this is possible by a discovery of a genotype which is called inducer genotype. Have you heard about this? There is a genotype in maize uh, we call them inducer genotypes. It was first discovered uh, by University of Oonai in Germany. Okay. So what is the speciality of this genotype? If you take pollen from this and apply it onto a female parent, the offspring that it produces will be only that of the female parent. There is no male contribution. Gender discrimination here. Right? In, in any sexual progeny, what you would expect? You would expect a 50% coming from female and 50% for male, right? But in this case, there is no male contribution. Male contribution is just to assist to start the process. But then all the progenies will just look like they are all progenies of they may not look like the male pair, the female one, but they will resemble. They will resemble only the female pair. There is no contribution from inducer. That's a very special genotype. But then now it is also being uh, I mean, just few years back it was restricted, there was no free licensing of this, but now Simit has taken it up because it was available in a temperate background. Now we are making it available in tropical background so that all developing country programs can use it. So you make a cross between this, you get haploid plants by identifying few kernels. Suppose if there are 100 kernels on the crop, only 10 or 15 will have that haploid The remaining are sexual kernels. Identify them, double it, so you can get double have one. This technology, as I told you, is really, really changed the way we do maize breeding. All the private sector uh, MNCs, 95 or 99% of their breeding program is here based on. And uh, I, I was told in Iowa earlier when we visited there, we 
their annual uh, output, DSI output is 1 million input lines per year uh, for their global operations per year. Okay, so the second development is on the genotyping platforms. As I told you, like cell phones, the cost for data point is falling. And we predominantly use instrument these platforms. Uh, are you familiar with these platforms? Have you read about this? Illumina Golden Gate platform. So this uses 1536 uh, SNPs are imprinted on one slide. So if you submit a sample, genotype it, you will get back 1536 data points for each sample that you Similarly, another platform is called the Infineum platform, that is also from Illumina, that contains 55,000 SNPs. Okay. And then the another platform is GBS, I told you earlier, it's like 2 million data points, 2 million data points per sample. And other than this, there are also another platform for, from K Biosciences, a company in UK, it's called Caspa Chemistry. This is the beauty of the system is single plex. So one snip at a time. So it gives you a special advantage. If you want to assay the population only for 200 selected markers, you don't want 2 million markers. You just want 200 markers because you know that your population is segregating only for those markers. If that is the case, then you don't have to waste your money using these platforms because these are very expensive platforms. So in this case, you can pick and choose your markers, SNPs. So that's called cost for chemistry and here the cost is very good, 10 to 12 cents per data. So gone are the days, you know, like if you have a mapping population, you don't have to toil in the lab doing SSRs, doing PCRs, get the gels and document it. So it it's all now time consuming process. To, with, with, the, with the advent of SNPs, just send the DNA to a service lab, get back the data and spend more time analyzing the data rather than generating the data. And generating is more a physical job, whereas analyzing is more a mind job. Right? So as, as a scientist, you, you have to spend more time on analyzing the job, analyzing the data and making use of the information rather than running around the lab generating the data. And the third important tool that I told you is CTNA based genotyping. Right? This is the base C. So this is the embryo and this is the endosperm. The endosperm is the nourishing tissue for embryo, right? So you can cut a small portion of the embryo, uh, sorry, the endosperm without disturbing the embryo because it's a non-destructive method. So afterwards, if you plant it in the field, it will still germinate because the embryo is intact. Okay? So you can chip off a small portion of the endosperm, extract DNA, and then Decide of the three seeds which one is carrying the favorable allele of my interest. Okay, only this one. So I will select only this one and plant it in the field. So that saves you a lot of logistic resources, land, management resources, and it gives you so much freedom, right? Do you recognize this instrument? Anyone knows? Anyone has pets in their house? Dogs. So these are dogs' toenail clippers. People who have pets, they use this for uh, clipping of the toenails. So that is used to cut a small portion of the endosperm. So this is very manual process, right? So it's like one by one you have to cut, and you have to keep, you have to maintain the identity of that seed to be able to select later. So this is right now. Then you should see some of the uh, systems of multinational companies again. Monsanto, Pioneer. They have what is called laser operated seed chippers. Okay. We have seen this in uh, their IO office. Excellent system. So, what they do is when the cobs are intact, when the seeds are not shell, they paint the cob with the magnetic emulsion. You know, the, this is the magnetic emulsion, they paint it. That helps in orienting the seed in the right direction. And then a laser beam cuts off a small portion of the endosperm without disturbing the embryo. And the cut portion is transferred to a plate. The seed 
goes to another plate, it's placed in a proper uh, well, with maintaining the identity, so everything is automated. Words, it's quite expensive system. So this is really a challenge. CDNA genotyping is very, really useful for the breeding programs, but then the small and medium sized breeding programs or standalone breeding programs, it's a little difficult because you can't invest such huge amount. So anything which is you know, less sophisticated is also useful. This is the system that we use, so it's manual. But if, if the breeding program grows further, perhaps you can also go for such systems. Okay, so the fourth, the fourth technology that which is which CIMIT is pursuing uh, very vigorously in the last uh, two to three years is called GWAS, genome wide association studies or association mapping or is there any other term? Have you heard about LD mapping? <laughs> linkage disequilibrium mapping. So all these are basically same. Linkage disequilibrium mapping, association mapping, genome wide association studies, all these are same. Versus the other approach is called linkage mapping. So I'm sure you would have studied a lot about linkage mapping. Linkage mapping or QTL mapping or family based mapping or uh, biparental mapping, all these are basically the same. So these two are very two distinct approaches. So we have been quite familiar with this QTL mapping approaches, right? I'm sure as a plant breeding student or genetic student, you would have studied about QTL mapping. Even if you're not working on QTL mapping, you would have studied by through research papers or textbooks. So you know what is QTL mapping, right? So you, you make cross between two parents, take an F1, which has each one chromosome from each, you self it, you get an F2. Get F2 individuals, and then you genotype this, phenotype this, identify QTLs, publish papers, and use it in breeding programs. Right? So that's as simple as that. But here only two parents are involved. So against this one, what is association mapping? In association mapping, you don't create artificially a mapping population by crossing two different lines. No. You take a collection of diverse lines. So it can be 300, it can be 500, it can be 1000. Anything more than uh, 300 is a good number in maize. That's what empirically we are fond of. So 300 good diverse inbred lines can be assembled into one association map population. And that can be used to genotype and phenotype. And then you can also identify QTLs like this here. So how are the recombinations done here? Because you are not making any process, right? So how is the recombination comes in here? These are historical recombinations. Now maize is cross-pollinated crop. In the history of evolution of crop, a lot of outcrossing has happened and all these recombination breakpoints are historical in nature. But actually this is more, more very powerful than these artificial recombinations that we have done. So if you have resources for evaluating 200 lines, I will not go for 200 lines of one biparental population. I would better go for 200 diverse single lines as a first step. Many biparental populations are also important, but then that's a second step for validation. So this association mapping can be of two types, right? Either it can be genome-wide association mapping, wherein you will use genome-wide markers. You will have a good uh, representation of the entire genome without making any preconceived ideas, okay, notions. The other approach is candidate gene-based association map. So here what you will do, suppose you are studying nutritional qualities in beta carotene and the carotenoid metabolism is well researched in Arabidopsis or in any other species. So once you know that there are certain genes which influence carotenoid content, you will just pick those genes or analogous genomic regions in maize and you will genotype only that genomic regions and you will make an association between that variation, gene-based variation and your trait. So that's more called gene-based, uh, candidate gene-based association. So why do we have to, so this, this is very helpful <coughs> when your trait is somewhat simple and you know a lot about that trait, either in that crop or in other crops. Whereas this one is more uh, thorough in its approach. No preconceived notions are here. 
So the entire genome is sampled and you are carrying a association mapping based on the entire genome polymorphism. So why is GWAS interesting in maize? Tremendous amount of diversity. For any trait, maize has a very impressive amount of diversity. Another important factor is the LDE. It's a linkage disequilibrium, as you said, you know, it's, it's, it's a tendency of two genomic regions to be inherited together. Right? There is no recombination between those regions. That's what LDE does. This LDE decays in maize very fast. So there are no big blocks in maize. As against rice or wheat or any self pollinated crop, you have big, big blocks. So it's very difficult to break those recombinations. Uh, those blocks. Whereas in maize, the uh, recombination rates are very high. This is the point to illustrate uh, tremendous diversity. So, among all the races, many different races, the diversity is only uh, similar, uh, only 0.09 percent they are different from each other. The similarity is only 0.09 percent. For the rest of the genome, they are all similar. Though phenotypically they all appear very distinct, they are all very similar and they differ only by 0 0.09 percent by right? human beings. And uh, human beings as one group, chimpanzee on the other side, what is the similarity? So the dissimilarity again is only 1.3 percent. For the rest of the genome, they are all similar. Right? Whereas in case of maize, one genotype of maize is different from other genotype of maize. <laughs> so this is just to prove that you know, the diversity available in maize is huge and that is one of the requirements for association. Okay, so you can ask me what are the success stories? Has this method really developed, uh, delivered? Have we identified uh, genes through this approach? Are they used in the breeding programs? Yes. At least for three traits. One is beta carotene content. Another one is uh, a disease called maize street virus. Have you heard about this disease? This is a very prevalent disease in Africa and it sticks confined only to Africa. Uh, unless a uh, lion carries this resistance, it will not survive. You know, so it's such a big disease and uh, high life in it for all these things. So I will just talk about this. Carotene uh, Okay. So as I told you earlier, the method followed was gene based. Association map. They identified two key genes, uh, MCYE, mycopene and cycle, and hydroxyl, this is called CRTR. These two genes were identified based on association map. Okay. So, what is the role of these two genes? If the function of this gene is blocked here, more of lycopene is available towards this part. Because this is the pathway we are interested in because it produces beta carotene. And beta carotene is the one which nutritionally makes more sense. And also here, if you block the pathway here, more of beta carotene is retained in the endosperm. Otherwise, it will get converted into subsequent form. So if you combine these two genes, more beta carotene is achieved. So it has a high practical reading value. So this, this trait has gone through the entire pipeline to association map. So upstream research was done to identify the genes. After identifying the genes, markers were developed and then those genes were introduced to get high provided genes. This is a commercial, uh, not commercial, it's a clear success story that uh, CIMIT has in the past, uh, in the last one or two years, they developed this one. And now uh, experimental hybrids or uh, a trial in Zambia. You see, before before MAS for these genes, two key genes, the pro A levels used to be one to three. After MAS, it has gone up to ten to fifteen. Just one gene. Uh, though there are two genes, we found later on that the second gene is more powerful than the first one than the lycopene and cycles. So with one gene you can get this much effort and this much increase and the cost is also tremendously. If you do HPLC assay, 
for determining high character lines. 